15 years and six months. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll start today. Hebrews 12, 3. Let's get through this. Let's get through this. For consider him who endures such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. In other words, he's saying, man, you ain't, you know, I'm not even asking you to die for me. I ain't asking you to give your right arm to serve me. I'm not asking you to cut out your tongue to serve me. I'm not asking you to never eat again to serve me. I'm not asking you to crawl on your knees everywhere you go for the rest of your life to serve me. I'm not asking you to do the rest of your life in prison just to serve me. He's saying, I ain't even asking all those things for you, and yet you, you, you still get discouraged. All I'm telling you is serve me. All I'm telling you is I'm telling you that other people have served me have had it harder so you can have it easier. But we got it so easy that the first time it gets hard, we get discouraged. Church. My son, do not despise the chastising of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. He chastens and scourges. That sounds bad. I mean, I bet you could probably say, man, he would slap you around and mess you up. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm telling you, man. I, I, I'm telling you. I, I remember getting spanked as a young kid. And then my dad come be like, come here. Sit on my lap. I love you. You love me, you just whip the tar out of me. You don't love me. <laughs> I go, you guys know how you show love? You know, I could have been 5'5", five five, you know, and just smacked in the 5'4". But can you imagine God coming down and totally exposing you? The key here, church, to discipline is embracing the problem. So, and the reason that I'm using the gym is because that's what I do, that's where I go, that's where I'm at, and that, that's, that's, that's what I do. So if I was something else, I'd use a different comparison. But when you go to the gym and you look at yourself, you say, okay, I need to work on certain parts of my body. Certain parts are developing and certain parts are, aren't developing, so I need to work harder over here and not so hard over here. See, and that's what God does. God exposes you. He puts you up under the lights and he begins to say, I like what you're doing over here. I don't like what's going on over here. I like what's happening over here. I don't like what's happening over here. Now, you better get disciplined before you'll ever get obedient. <laughs> Who would you rather have, an obedient kid or one that needs discipline? Come on, I'll take an obedient one. But if I keep disciplining that kid one day, he will be obedient. Okay, so, seven. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are Ill illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they decided for a few days to chasten chasing us and as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may not be partakers of his holiness. Now listen. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. At the moment when God is correcting you, it doesn't seem very fun. It doesn't seem like the place you want to be. And then it goes on to say it's not joyful for the present, but painful. Any time that God is going to discipline you, you better hang on because it's going to be painful. Because he is graceful, he is merciful, he is agape love, he, he is patient with us and he loves us. But he loves us so much that, it, that he takes his discipline serious. He may bring you down, but he wants you to get up changed, not touched. But change. We come to church and we get touched, but we never get changed. We come in here and we feel him, but we don't take him with us. Amen. So he says, man, for a moment, it's going to seem terrible. For a moment, when you got to finally give in, when you got to finally admit, okay, I was wrong. Okay, I, I, shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have I was wrong. Lord, I need to be disciplined. What is it that your will would be for me? What's your discipline for me? Who would you 
want for me to do. And when you embrace that process, then it slowly turns from discipline to obedience. Church, obedience. Okay, let's finish up discipline and let's jump into obedience. Obedience is shorter than discipline. Discipline will maintain sound faith. If you are disciplined, you will maintain a sound faith. If you are disciplined, discipline will correct disorder. It will correct disorder. Discipline will remove the wicked. Discipline will produce understanding. Discipline will drive out foolishness. Discipline will deliver you from hell. Now here's my favorite for you right now. Discipline or a disciplined person will develop reverence for God. Reverence. One thing that we don't have very much in these, in these uh, churches today is reverence. Reverence. We don't have reverence is respect and honor. Reverence is, I'm not going to chew gum in church. It's a reverence thing. I'm not going to uh, play games on my phone during church because it's reverence. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, come to the house of God and hit on the single ladies. I'm not going to come to the house of God and hit on the single men because this is holy ground. This is where I need to have my reverence. See, a disciplined person will have reverence. It will develop a reverence for God. Last but not least, discipline produces obedience. Discipline produces obedience. It's so funny to be on my end of the spectrum because to be on my end of the spectrum, my uh, situations, my uh, ministry, my uh, finances, my um, uh, pretty much most of the of dictating my life comes through the obedience of others. Yes, yes, yes. People can come back and say, you know what, I got, God told me to do something for you. I was disobedient, but I want to fix it. I want to do it now. Boom. So what I do is I am relying on the obedience of God. I know God will never leave me, nor forsake me. He'll always be here with me. He'll always make a way. He'll always do something for me. I know I'm covered. I know I'm ready. But when God, when you begin to be obedient and you walk in God's obedience and you bless somebody in God's obedience, ooh, my, you shine like a brand new dime right in the middle of the day because God is looking for obedient men and women that he can move through that he can move through obedience means submission to authority ah that's the one submission to authority submission to authority first time pastor corrects you you go tell everybody the church hurt you I mean, you know what? Oh, the church hurt me. What happened? Oh, the pastor yelled at me about something. I don't know. You know how he is. So self-righteous. Well, come here, don't go that way. He made me take my back, uh, my baseball cap off, man. I don't take it off for nobody, man. I always wear it. I wear it in the shower and everything. I ain't trying to make it. <laughs> so what happened? I don't know the church, the pastor, he hurt me. What? The ba- he, did what? he hurt you. You look fine to me. Feel as ugly as ever. Come on. Come on. Be ugly but obedient. Ooh, obedient people are so beautiful. I tell you, if you're ugly today, be obedient. That's my secret. That's my beauty secret. Obedient. Amen? All right. Submission to authority. You must submit to authority. You know what? And let me tell you something here, church. Let me tell you something here. You know, I, it's what I do is I'm pretty free with that front door. You know, come, go, come, go. I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm used to it. I'm used to taking that on. I, I understand. You know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not real, you know, uh, caught up too much. If God wants you here, you come. If God doesn't, he won't. Uh, but if God has put you under my authority, if God has put you under my authority, under my authority, and as you submit to the authority that God has put over you, then he can begin to bless your life and put you over authority in other people's lives. Come on. I don't, well, I'm not at the top of the totem pole here. I mean, there are men that are above me. 
that I have to submit to their authority. I have to submit to their prayer lives. I have to submit to their wants and to their needs. And when something comes up or something happens, I have to run to these men. I have to run because I am relying on their authority over my life. When I come humbly and say, what should I do? What is God telling you? Where should I be? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I pack it up or should I keep fighting? Should I go forward? Because I submit to your authority and you as authority over me. If you tell me I can make it, if you tell me that I'm healed, if you give me a word, if you give me a direction, I will submit to your authority and believe that God will give it to me. Can you say amen? Why? Because I submit to your authority. And the one thing that I will be under your authority is obedience. Because now I don't need to be disciplined anymore. I've been disciplined. I've been scraped up, knocked down, turned around, beat down, and hurt. But now I'm moving from discipline because I've learned in my hour of discipline that all God wants me to be is obedience. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, I tell you, to be obedient is sacrifice. And any time you sacrifice is obedience. So you can't have one without the other. So as I live and breathe outside of discipline and move and breathe inside of obedience, I'm ready to sacrifice. See? So, good. so when he took his son up to the mountain to kill him, his favorite son, his son of promise, his son of destiny, his son of his old age. God says, take that boy up to the mountain and sacrifice him. Yes. Now, I, you know, I don't know, you got sons or daughters or whatever you have, you know, a puppy or a cat or something. If God told you, if God told me tomorrow, take Darren up to Pelon's Peak. That's what I call it. There's a Victor's Valley in Pelon's Peak. In the mountain. And he's taking Darren up to the pillow and speak, and you kill him to show me you love me more than you love him. Come on, think about it. I, 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 I think I spanked Darren once, man. I still feel bad. I'm still like, oh man, I hit poor kid. This is frail. I came out like he stole something. I said, Kill him to show me you love me more. You might as well have told me in my day, take, 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 take your drugs to the top of the mountain and kill him to show that you love me more than that. You don't know. Take that. Take that addiction. Take that frustration, take that anger, take that hatred, take that sickness, take that ability, take it all the way up to the mountain and kill it in proof that you love me more than you love them. The exciting part is the man did it and raised such a good son that the son said, Father, where is the sacrifice? And the dad looks at his son both knowing what's about to happen. He says, God will provide. It wasn't, it didn't become, now you got to understand in those times, he was not the only man sacrificing his children to their gods. It was a common practice amongst the heathens at that time. Sometimes it was their daughters, sometimes it was their son, sometimes it was all the children from one wife that were sacrificed to the gods. So he takes his son up there and he goes to sacrifice him and an angel stops him. Not only does the angel stop him, but he supplies the sacrifice because the sacrifice still needs to be killed. See? See? The thing that makes him legendary that we would still talk about that family today is what? His obedience. He didn't say why. He didn't say what. He didn't say, Lord, let's talk about it. He said, okay, let's go. Your obedience will make you legendary. Okay, so 2 Corinthians, I'm almost done. Let me read these quick scriptures and we'll get out of here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, 